how much will prices keep going down? Because at the beginning you said like even before COVID, price, the prices were were going up because just nuts. Colorado is attractive to, to people. Yes. It's like, will it still keep going down, or is it at some point it's gonna stop and then just? Uh, we're kind of paying for it now. We're so low for so long that we probably should have gone up a little farther sooner. Because two and a half percent was a fantasy land. Yeah, no, right? that's, that was, that's that is, not. That was not normal. Are they getting lazy or just exposed? <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Uh. Underrated, underrated, we the underdogs, underestimated. Yeah. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to the Totem Podcast. Like always, I'm your host here, Monaco Carrillo. But always, of course, we got Eric here with us. Yeah, how you guys doing? Yeah, my, my name's Eric Creo, and I'm your other, your other co-host on the podcast. Um, but guys, remember that we're on YouTube and Spotify. Um, just search us up as the Totem Podcast. Um, but if you guys like the conversations we're having and want us to keep bringing on more guests, then, you know, please just give it a thumbs up. And also make sure to subscribe to the channel and just share it with one other person if, if, if you kind of like what we're having, the conversations we're having here. Um, that's pretty much the only few we have for the podcast is just share it with one other person. Yeah, so today we're we're a little extra honored, Eric. We got we don't got one guest, we got two guests today, so that's yep. extra extra special. But uh, their their industries is very important of stuff going on today in today's economy and stuff, and their industries both go hand in hand. So it's uh, we decided we're like, hey, we should all just do it all together. So Connor and Priscilla, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate you having us. Yeah. So for the people who don't know who you guys are, can you just give like a brief explanation of who you are and like what you do? Gonna get yeah. first Priscilla. We'll yeah, go with yeah. you first. Okay. First. Well, um, I know Connor because we worked uh, together for a few years at Wells Fargo, um, and once I uh, decided to change jobs, I got into the real estate market, and it was funny. We kind of met through clients a little bit, and mm -hmm. I found out that Connor was kind of hand in hand in the real estate market and not with Wells Fargo anymore. So, mm -hmm. um, but I've I've been in a financial um, industry my entire life. I managed Wells Fargo banks, and then before that, I uh, sold cars for over a decade, and so. Um, I definitely know what it looks like to prepare a, a credit report and a credit application, and, and that's just kind of been the basis of, of my careers. Yeah. And uh, again, Connor Bodock in here with Aslan Home Lending, but again, a special thanks to the two of you for, you know, Eric and Monica, appreciate that you guys having us, but then also Pr uh, Priscilla for, for thinking of me. Of course, like Priscilla said, we worked together for quite a few years, and uh, I've been in home lending now for almost two years, but similar to Priscilla, I was uh, with uh, Wells Fargo for a while. I was in the private banking and kind of wealth planning side of things, uh, but been you know in the financial industry now for about 12 years, and so it's uh, I very much love what I do now, uh, <laughs> and uh, just super blessed to to be here. But again, thanks for having us, and thank you for thinking yes. of me. Yeah. Yeah, no, but, but huge shout out to Priscilla. She was the one that put it all together, you know. Huge <laughs> shout out to Priscilla. Yeah. Let me repeat that. Well, you did so well with Chris. So I was like, hey, yeah. I have something good to talk about too. So nice. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to do this. Yeah. This is good. Yeah, we, we've had like real estate people on here before, but then without like the mortgage kind of lending side of it, oh. so it's kind of like, it's good to put it together yes. so we can, because they, they both really do go hand in hand. Those, oh. those mortgage guys really bring the room together for sure. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. when <laughs> when you're in the real estate market, I think I probably have uh, definitely three guy, three mortgage guys that I talk to all the time. I mean, I, and I basically get the same answers from them. Um, but, you know, I try to stay in my lane. My, my customers looking for houses or trying to sell houses will ask me mortgage questions. And I'm like, Connor. Yeah. Help me out. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and on that point, that's a, you know, and it's good that y'all kind of brought that up. Like there's a natural partnership, you know, between lenders and realtors always. But, right. and because there's so many of us, it's really crucial mm -hmm. that it, for me on my side to have an amazing power partner, like somebody like Priscilla, who... You build your team. Yeah, you build it. Well, and, and it's, you know, based on communication, but it's also about, you know, if, if I look at it as the client's at the center of everything we do and we are you know as their fiduciary of sorts like we're really thinking you know if i'm if i'm in your shoes and you're buying a house i want to be i want to make the best decisions for you and present the best information but also present the best people cuz those people are going to a going to get us to the finish line but b like they're going to treat you the right way they're going to yeah. make you feel good about doing business with them. And it sounds so much better when you have clients and you can say, this is my mortgage lender. I've known him for over eight years. Yeah. 
if you're just like, oh, here's some names, you know, I they work for this company, go ahead yeah. and call them up and apply with them. That there, there's no value there. Yeah. But if somebody asks me about Connor, I literally can say how long I've known him. I know how he works. I know how brilliant he is and what he does. Um, I talk to him all the time. It's not just a, oh, I talk to him a couple of times a year. That is not the truth. We talk at least monthly, sometimes weekly, depending yeah. on what's going on. Absolutely. Um, and so anybody in your team, whether it's appraisers or a plumber or a mortgage person, you should be able to say what you know about them and how much you trust them because they're just an extension of you. Yeah. Yeah, and as like so like for someone looking to buy a house, like it's much like easier, and they, they, they feel better when they know that there's a relationship mm -hmm. instead of them just giving you out names and stuff. So you're like, I don't know if they're gonna be good or not. Yeah, but it's better exactly. when they, that relationship is like in place Correct. already before huh. going mm -hmm. into it. And I think that the key where you just said there, Eric, was relationship. It really like we it's a relationship based industry. You know, even if we are the smartest people in the room, frankly, I mean, that helps, but it doesn't always really matter. It's more about, you know, do we care about our clients? Are we putting other people in front of them that also care about them? And is that a great relationship between the two of us? And, you know, people are smart. They're going to notice. They're mm -hmm. going to see like, oh, these people really like each other. They work well with each other. They're working on my behalf. Or <laughs> if they right. don't work well, you know, they're going to see the opposite. Yeah. Oh, that's good. So I guess uh, since we're in this the, the economic stuff, what what addressed the elephant in the room? I guess uh, what what are, what are you guys' uh, what thoughts that you guys have right now? Like, I'll, we'll start with you. Like, with yeah. interest rates and stuff. Like, what? Like, Sh sure. No, because it's, it's been it's been huge. From like, they've never been historically that low. Like, because right. I guess I I don't know the exact percentage, but there has has to be like three or five something like that for a bank even to make money off of it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, they were like at 2% and now they're like, they're pretty much what, to break seven? Yeah, mm -hmm. about seven-ish. So yeah, it, it and you know, I, I think here's the thing on interest rates is that we've seen interest rates this high before, you know, I mean, the historical average, you know, over since I think like the mid seventies is, you know, a little above 7%. So it's not that we haven't seen them before, but that you hit the, you hit the nail on the head, the, the volatility or the quick, how quickly they've gone from as low as they were to where they are now. That's what of course kind of puts people back on their heels. And, mm -hmm. and again, the, it's really scary when that kind of stuff happens, but you know, overall it's such a, you know, in interest rates are such an individualized thing. You know, we have 15 to 20 different factors that go into, you know, every single scenario for, for each individual client. Um, but yeah, you know, there, I, I think really the bigger picture is, you know, I try to focus on, you know, because when I hear interest rates, really what it is is the the cost that it's going to cost you to buy a home and what your monthly payment is ultimately going to be. And those are the things that I, you know, in my experience that I've seen people focus on more. You know, they want to know how much, you know, can I purchase? What's it going to cost me? And what's my estimated monthly payment? You know, really. And I think what most consumers are wanting the mortgage industry to do right now is predict the future. Oh, yeah. That's so easy. So when are rates going to go <laughs> back Get that crystal ball. Get yeah, that yeah. crystal ball out of the back. What is it going to look like in December? What is it going to look like in January? <laughs> yeah. When are they going back oh, down? Let's, let's, right? let's, and that's what I call you for. Yes. I'm like, yeah. Connor, and I give, get I, your crystal ball. I rub, I rub my crystal ball. I tell her the prediction. And then I make millions upon millions of dollars. No, it's it's you know it's definitely something where... You know, actually, interestingly enough, not to get too, you know, nerdy, but it's it, last Thursday, the 10th, there was some uh, inflation data that came out that uh, indicated that it looks like we've kind of peaked now, again, in terms of inflation. Now, we'll see what happens because, you know, every month these statistics come out and we have to kind of judge is inflation continuing to go down. Um, if that does continue to happen rates will most likely follow. That's that's just kind of the historical uh, information that we've seen. So I would say right now we're looking, you know, like we're trending in the right direction. Um, <laughs> do, do I know where they'll end up? No. Uh, do I know where the, when we'll get there? Probably not, but it 
sooner than later, you know, I could see anywhere from, you know, the middle of next year towards the end of next year, somewhere, you know, in that in that time frame, we'll get back into a more, you know, quote unquote, stable uh, time where maybe rates will get back into the fives. So. Because two and a half percent was a fantasy land. Yeah, no, right? that's, that was, that's that is, not that was not normal. That's how not how did they get that low? Oh boy, the COVID. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we blame everything on COVID. Yeah, but well, we we already do. I know. But you know, I think realistically, that was uh, because of you know anything. Anytime you see uh, economic uncertainty or when there's a ton of fear, that's when the volatility increases and that's when things go crazy. So, you know, obviously COVID was an, an incredible example of that. We, nobody, in March of 2020, there wasn't a single person on the planet that could predict what was gonna happen the next week, the next month, the next, you know, six months next year. So in times like that, you know, that's really where, because things were so crazy, the you know there was a lot of things happening in the background that allowed interest rates to float down that low um and obviously they they still wanted to make sure that economic activity was happening so you know if you're not sure about buying a house or or financing a car or or whatever it is you know put those interest rates really low and that will incentivize people to continue to, to get out there and spend. To, continue to get out there and spend their money to buy. Yeah, because I just think of it like, so like you know the pay the interest rates are high, so there's obviously like repercussions for that. So when they're low, I feel like there has to be repercussions for it either because the average, like we said, is like around seven ish around you know. Yeah. So it's like if it's way too low, something has to happen and kind of give it back up. When or, yeah. or if it's really high, you know. So I mean, what do you, what do you think has to happen for that stuff to, you know? Well, and I think, you know, part of the repercussions you were just talking about, we're kind of paying for it now. You know, we, we were so low for so long that we probably should have gone up a little farther sooner. Um, you know, but now we're, that's why, again, you saw the volatility where... Um, a couple months, it just... It, it just keeps on going up. But again, we're, you know, it feels like at some point we're going to have to reach that top of where that, you know, things will start to slow down. And then, you know, once we hit that, we'll come back down again. So, yeah, it was so low for so long. And, you know, now we're, <laughs> you know, we had to raise it at some point. Um, frankly, you know, that, and that's part of where the Federal Reserve comes into play. They are, you know, of course, the governing banking body throughout the entire country. And when they raise their interest rates, it puts pressure on mortgage interest rates to also increase. So it's not a direct correlation. You know, it doesn't go one for one. But any time that they raise their rates, there's going to be pressure on, on the mortgage rate side as well. Yeah, because I've been reading like some articles and stuff. I mean, some, depending where they come from or like, you don't know if to believe them or not, but there's a couple of them saying that it could break 10. Do you think, it, do you think it could get that high? Oh I mean, man. Cause there's been, sometimes you go back in the 80s, 70s, yeah. it was like 15 or wasn't it like that? 15, in 17. In the 90s, it was 12. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, mm -hmm. do you think with 10 is like, it's not that bad. It's, it's bad to what we're used to, but it's not that bad historically. But back then you didn't have a four bedroom home. At six hundred thousand dollars, yeah, it was one hundred eighty thousand dollars. So that interest rate, even though it was over ten or what, what have you, it just it didn't seem that unnormal, and it wasn't astronomical per month. Yeah, and and people really had good savings back then when they were getting started out. Um, but I think it's important to to note we so before COVID even started, our state of Colorado had a a huge amount of people moving here every month. Mm -hmm. And so before COVID even became a thing, house values were going up. Um, we sold our house in 2019, before COVID, obviously, in West Greeley, um, and made, I, I want to say it was over $100,000, 100000 and we were there for less than five years, maybe. Um and we did finish the basement and everything like that, but it just, it increased so quickly and that just continued to happen. So then when COVID hit and then the rates went low and everything, people were still wanting to move here. 
there were still good jobs, and I think it's still important to know that that hasn't slowed down, you know. Um, but when COVID hit, we had a lot of investors that were coming from California and oil companies coming from Texas, and they were buying up properties with cash. And so that made it very, very hard for the first-time home buyers because we would submit an offer for them in 2020 and 2021, and they would just get beat out like crazy because a first-time home buyer doesn't have $100,000 to put down. You know, they're, they're lucky if they, they get a first time home buying program that only requires them to put 10 grand down or less. Mm -hmm. So it was just unfeasible for them to, to get anything. And now I'm hearing from even other lenders, go, go back and, and dig up those first time home buyers because now the market's mm -hmm. slowed and the ones that have cash are holding back a little bit because they want to see those houses sit on the list a little longer and then those sellers will drop their prices. And, and a cash buyer is always looking for a great deal, right? Because money talks. Yeah. But they're telling us to dig up these first-time home buyers and the first-time home buyers are going, yeah, but I got quoted a $1,200 month payment for yeah. a $350,000 home yeah. a year ago and now it's $2,700 with the rate increase. And it's just, again, it's out of their grasp it's, yeah, it's with a, their income. It's, it's ridiculous. I actually had a, a, some written stats because the median price home is like 577, right? Colorado? Yeah. yeah. Probably. So it's yeah, like around sounds. 577 with the with 3% interest, it comes like, it's like 1950 roughly, you know, yeah. and that's without taxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah, and, all that. and then so like now that 7%, you look at it, the same is 577 and it's 3000, it's over 3000. Right. So it's like right. your buying power is just, you know. So unfortunately, with, with all of that, not looking at everything, we have some people that have come into both of our industries, and they kind of just make things up. And so <laughs> you will, you know, you'll, your clients will come to you and they'll say, well, I heard another agent say this. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and one of the, the main things right now is date the rate. Oh, Do you yeah. want to explain yeah. date the rate? Oh, I can't wait. Um, <laughs> Sounds romantic. It yeah. is. No, it's, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> it's not. It's, no, what's funny about it is it's, uh, it is a little played out, the message, but the concept is, is good. Uh, but yes, every lender but, and but their the mother. But the ones that are saying it yeah. are not explaining it the right way. That's They're yeah. just rushing their clients to get in and sign, sign, sign. Yep. And, and is this a mortgage lender saying or this a realtor? Is, yes. Yes. It's it's both both? Okay. And it's both sides, but it's mostly a originated for, definitely from the lender side where, you know, so the concept is this, is you, you know, you want to get back into the market now because, and, and again, this is where there is some truth to this. It's a much friendlier market. So, you know, kind of what Priscilla was saying before in the market, when you were, you know, rates were at three, three and a half percent, you were having to overpay to try to compete yeah. with these other offers. You had that were 50 late. offers the first day you had an, an active listing. It was crazy. And you had to pay fifty to $75,000 more than what the house was worth. And so again, you're kind of going into it paying, you know, X amount, but really, you know, so for instance, I, I ran a little bit of numbers as well. I was gonna say, I'm glad yeah. you also got, glad. got some numbers on your side. It was on the calculator, don't okay, worry. I'll, I did it on the calculator. Okay, yeah, <laughs> the big, big calculator. Well, and, and really, so even like, just take like a $400,000 home, you know, kind of what we would, what at one point we would have considered a, a starter home. And in 21, you were having to overpay, say 50 grand for that. So you're really getting a $400,000. So you're walking home. with no equity. Yeah, no equity, mm -hmm. potentially negative equity because sure. you're overpaying. But then if you took this and if you took the same kind of down payment on both sides, you and then fast forward to today, we now you can get the $400,000 house, say for $400,000, but obviously rates have doubled. So your payments about five to $600 more a month but you're having, but you're instead of having to overpay by fifty thousand, now you're getting something at value, and that fifty thousand now, if you purchase the house today again at that same rate, same price, you it would take you almost eight or nine years to make up the difference, just even based on the fact that you're, and that's without refinancing, and that's, so you know, basically the idea being, pay for pay for something that's valuable now and get it at the value that it's actually advertised at. And then ultimately, even though rates are higher, you can refinance at some point, you know, within say the next one to two years. And that's, that's the whole marry the house. So again, get into the house, find the house that's right. worth the value that it's worth. 
uh, date the rate, meaning, you know, generally speaking, nobody stays it's like, like on a 30 year fixed mortgage. Nobody stays in that for 30 years. The average right. time is anywhere between five to seven years uh, within that first loan. And you don't really start building equity until about five years of ownership. You know. Typically. Yeah. Um, just, just, can I, I, I just yeah, have yeah. a quick question on that. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I, me and Eric were talking about it the other day. Yeah. I, somebody, you know who you are probably, you, they put a, like a little <laughs> meme out there. And then it, and it said, and it said the are. thing, and it was like, I hope they hear us. I way. hope they hear it. We're, we're gonna, you, I'm going to send it you to might them now. Name, you might, you are, you're like this close to name dropping. I know. But you might as well. I should, huh? <laughs> yeah. So, so it, was a, it was a thing. It says paying 7%. Thirty grand under listing price is better than paying a hundred k more at two percent. Yes, and I ran the numbers and it didn't make sense. So essentially, the idea is okay. So your your payment is more, obviously, right? So let's say, like in my example, I was throwing out there, I was putting everything all in. Your payment was about five hundred dollars more today, but you paid four hundred thousand yeah. dollars. You didn't have to overpay, so your loan is less. Yeah. You're starting with more equity. Whereas even in my first example, your loan was about $50,000 higher. So again, you, and that house is not worth as, you know, let's say the house is worth the same amount when you bought it. So you're starting with negative equity. To make up the difference in that 50000 you know, let's say at $500 a month, if you take the 50000 divided by 500 you know, you get it. It's like 8.33 something, something. So okay. again, about eight to eight and a half years just now, obviously, I, I, that I, I get what you, I get what you the mean. Con, yeah, and yeah, that's okay. it, obviously you're going to change your loan within eight years. You might sell the house within eight years. You're, you're definitely going to refinance it within the first eight years. So, you know, one way or the other, that's going to change. But the idea is I bought something, you know, I saw something for five dollars and I purchased it for five dollars versus I saw something for five dollars and I bought it for ten. You know, so the idea is you're gaining equity and equity is really where the wealth comes into yeah. play. You know, we we talk a lot in our industry about building wealth through real estate. The wealth, a lot of that comes from the equity that you're building in there. So if you're starting ahead, it's a lot easier. So, yeah, again and again, you're going to okay. refinance probably within one to two years because um, rates will come back down within right. that amount of time. And now that you said rates will come back down, so that takes me back to the whole verbiage of date the rate, right? Uh -huh. Buy the house, date the rate. Yep. So right now, agents, real estate agents, are using that verbiage more because they're they're rushing their people to purchase. Like, oh, it's great right now because actually you're seeing prices drop on houses and the rates will come back down, right? But you can't go into that prom over promising and under delivering. Mm -hmm. I can't tell my client, yeah, just sign up at 8% right now, but psh, by March, they're going to be back down. I don't know that. Yeah. Don't tell your people that. Don't confuse them. But I'm also, I know these agents out here are probably going to be like, oh, she's telling she's people not to buy. Smack. That's yeah. not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is everybody's financial situation is different, whether they're buying or selling. He's not going to have the same conversation with somebody going through a divorce who needs to sell their home compared to a first time home buyer. Mm -hmm. His financial conversation with those two situations is gonna be completely different. Mm -hmm. So you can't just be a generic agent or a generic mortgage guy <laughs> and just say, here's the puzzle piece that everybody fits into. Yeah. That's that's not accurate. It, it's it's highly customizable, of course, lending, you know, and again, we will, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I won't, that, that's a rabbit hole that we don't need to go down into, but it's, it's, it's extremely, extremely customizable. And the other thing to, to Priscilla's point, the whole date, the rate thing that I isn't going to get as much, you know, uh, social media, you know, attention or radio play is you, again, you have to qualify to refinance. Right. I mean, you could be in a great position to qualify right now. In, in a year and a half from now, rates are, say, in the mid fours. You come back and you're like, Connor, I want to refinance at, at 30 year fixed at, you know, four and a half percent. We have to go through the same loan application. It's a whole new loan again. It, it's, it's a whole a new loan, loan again. So, so wanna, yeah, yeah. I'm, and I'm sorry to no, interrupt no, no, you, go for but it. I just want to grasp this because I know a lot of people are wondering. Yeah. We're seeing concessions thrown out there all yeah. over the place. I was looking, um, I go onto Iris every morning, and that's the MLS of the state of Colorado. 
And I had 27 new messages last Monday, and they were all agents that had added, and I'm not even exaggerating, between twenty five dollars and $50,000 in concessions under their listings in the Boulder area. Now, yes, we are talking houses that are probably above $700,000 to a million and a half. Sure. But still, if I am a buyer, and you're my mortgage guy, and I say, oh, Connor, I got $50,000 of concessions. How much I, can you buy my rate down? I that First of all, I'm going to say that excites me. Uh, because that's the other thing about this market. And again, this is a little bit away from the whole date, the rate, marry the house, but the, this particular market, not only are we seeing things at fair value, but then it's also seller concessions. And, you know, this is something I hammered in on a lot last week. Uh, I've been kind of, you know, screaming it from the rooftops. There are all sorts of ways to buy down your rate. So a buy down is essentially you're telling the lender, Hey, I will give you more money to get a lower rate. So there, there's a cost for that and there's a strategy to that, but there is a way that you can actually buy down or get a lower interest rate. So, so what's the dollar amount that I need to buy so, down if I qualify for a six and a half? And I say, well, what can you do with my $50,000 concession? How many points are you going to buy down for me? So, and that's the thing. It's, uh, that's really where, again, it comes down to that it's customizable. It'll be depending on what your loan amount is, what your credit score is, what, you know, the individual factors are. But I can tell you straight up 50000 is a massive amount. I mean, that's right. going to buy you down at least potentially two, maybe three points, who knows. But again, it just depends on that loan amount. And there's also other strategies too. Uh, the other thing that's getting a lot of attention in our industry is what's called a 2-1 buy-down. Um, Before you go yeah, on yeah, a little go further, for it. Go uh, for it. give us like a little breakdown. So what is like seller concessions? Like, cause there's a lot of people that don't know that. Sure. And when they're going through the paper, they'll give you this in concessions and a lot of the average person is probably gonna be like, yeah. what does that mean? No, concessions is money that you can use for multiple things. So on the day of closing, it's still money that comes out of the seller's equity at the end. Um, so why do they package it like like a new thing now? Why don't they just say... The again, uh -oh. it's individualized. I was going to say, why don't they just say like the house was <laughs> seven, 750 Now we're going to be 700 Like to make exactly. it... Because I that's feel like that's always, where the average person gets confused. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, they just tangle them up and they're like, yeah. That's always my um, argument. Why, why all of a sudden you know, are we getting worried and wanting to throw $10,000 in concessions when my listing is not getting any views because it's not priced appropriately. And my sellers might be like, oh, I don't want to budge yet. It's like, well, but we haven't gotten any showings for a week. So instead of just handing over concessions, why don't we just drop it by 10 grand? The money has to come from somewhere. It's still going to be like... It has to come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. But I've, I've worked deals where the buyer will send an offer and say, you know, I... I want to buy your house, but I notice there's no bathroom in the basement, even though there's two bedrooms down there. Can you give us $5,000 in concessions so we can get started? Do we know if that person, that buyer is going to actually finish the basement? No. So but on closing day- You don't want to day, buy the house then if, the, if you're still, like, I want to buy the house, but it doesn't have a bathroom. Uh, then you probably yeah. don't want to buy the house, then you want- Yeah. yeah. But, on, but on closing day, they literally get a check of $5,000 that comes from the seller's yeah. equity. So, so it, instead so of like dropping way. down the price, they do, okay. Yeah. Yes. So, and, and again, you can use that money for, you know, again, just lowering your closing costs. So mm -hmm. paying your, your loan costs and your closing costs, you can pay for origination fees. You can pay for what we call discount points or the, what buy, now if brings that's, your rate lower. If that's the idea though, you guys have to know about it before closing. That is true. Because you're going to notate it in their financing that they are getting that additional money to do on the buyer side what they need to do correct and so that has to be tracked well and i would rather know about it ahead of time because then we can strategize we can decide you know does it make more sense to pay for your closing costs does it make more sense to lower your loan amount does it make more sense to use it for a rate buy -down? right so on closing day i couldn't get my five thousand dollar check for this bathroom i want to build and be like oh never mind i want you to buy down my rate with it yeah no that would <laughs> that would be uh can't do that. Gonna, be nice. yeah can't can't do that on the fly no. uh but and that's you know again some people it might just make more sense to not do anything different with their loan, but just simply take the cash because they have, you know, they have bigger priorities there. So again, it's so it's, it really depends on what you as a consumer or as an individual want and what your goal is. And I've seen a really easy concession thrown in there too, when 
the person is just in a rush to sell and they just don't have a lot of time to fix up the house and it just, I mean, noticeably needs new carpet and they'll just tell the buyer, well, I'll throw in $2,500 in concessions so you yeah. guys can replace the carpet. I don't have time to do it. Yeah. So I, I think I think Priscilla's point, though, about, you know, hey, the money's going to come from somewhere. You just... Need One side to, or the other. You know, you're just... you it, And then that's the other thing is buyers, you know, in last year's market where there were, you know, 50 offers going in on every home, everything was about... Seller concessions did not exist. Right. They didn't have to concede anything. No. Like, they were going to get way more than the house is worth. Yeah. They oh, could yeah. leave the dirty carpet. Right. They could they could leave the the th they could have three bedrooms in the in the basement without a single bathroom. Right. People were still gonna buy it, but now you know it's now that things are sitting a little longer. There's less buyers in the market. You know there it is a great way to incentivize a buyer to work with you and you know. And buyers are gonna pick your listings apart nowadays. They just have the ability to. So right? is that a buyer's market now? You think it's it going is. more that way? Absolutely. It's and unfortunately, what we're seeing is, what I'm seeing, I'm not going to speak for anybody else, um, <laughs> but agents have become very lazy. Mm -hmm. And they got so used to, in 2021 and 2020, these deals just falling to their lap, but now it's time to work, right? Are they getting lazy or just exposed? <laughs> Ooh. I mean, because I think there's a lot, because I, I, I mean, personally, that, I mean, you, ha, you have experience in that. And then there's yeah. a lot of them that are just like, they became a realtor a year ago, two years ago, and now they have, they're, they're not making it. You know? you know, the company I work for, Realty One Group, they set me up with the best, most knowledgeable, most firecracker, um, <laughs> right, Natalie? Yeah, Natalie, um, yeah. Mentor that I have ever seen. Mm -hmm. and, and I've met a lot of real estate agents and their mentors. And she trained us from the beginning. She had 13 mentees at one point. Unbelievable. This, this lady is incredible. But she trained us from the beginning. You show up to every appraisal. You show up to every inspection. You show up to every plumber appointment. It, it doesn't matter if it's on the buyer-seller side. It, if you are a part of that deal, you need to know what's going on. You don't want your clients to call you and be like, oh, so what did the plumber say? Oh, I don't know. Let me call him and find out. I'll get back to you. No, you want to say, you know, I was there. They said this was not a big deal. They gave me a printed out report. I'm going to fax it over to you. Da, da, da. I was there with them for two hours. You want to be hands on. And even before it was a buyer's market, I had met, you know, people at just open houses and stuff. And I'm like, mm -hmm. geez, you didn't even have these people clean up. Like it smells like cat pee in here. Mm -hmm. Or, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that house still sold, by the way. <clears throat> Still, sold. Yeah, still, sold. still got still 50 sold. grand over. Still got 50 um, grand over. <laughs> or, you know, they'll, you, as agents, we pay for professional photographers to come in and do aerial shots and do these nice photos in the house. And the agent won't even go through and be like, look, there's a diaper genie with overflowing diapers. Make sure that that's cleaned up before my photographer comes in here and takes a photo. The photographer does not have time to come in and move things and clean your house and whatever. And they will literally snap photos and then they post them online. And you're like, well, and sometimes will, they, will, they, Eric? So, will they, Eric? Will, will they, Eric? I don't know. Eric, Eric. I don't know. I, I like to just make sure everything's good. And even yes. though it does take a little bit of time, good. I'm like, you know what? This doesn't look good. I know they're not going to like it. And okay. I'm just going to put like a bad light on like yeah. the sellers and like the, the real estate agents. So, but like, I had just clean it up a little bit. In Centennial, a few months ago, I had a competitor that was right down the block from my listing. And she, they literally had piled of trash as tall as the car on the side of the house. And that was one of the main photos. And I was like... You couldn't pull those bags and that wood <laughs> or, like away, just maybe twenty feet out of the shot. Like, or don't or use, the use the photo. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Or don't, use say, the photo. don't use that photo. So well, and it's, it's cell people phone are just cameras. like you photo, said. Photo, there's Photoshop. Like, you could have colored it in yeah. or something. Oh my gosh, <laughs> something. But yeah. Oh man, no, and and you know, kind of going back to like what we were talking about at the beginning of, you want to work with you know high quality people. I mean, if you think about any industry, you know, any line of work, there are. There are people who are really good at what they do. There are people who are not so great at what they do. Generally, over time, the cream rises to the top. The folks that are, you know, the, the people who are going to stay in the industry, even if they just got in the industry, the folks who know what's, what, what's going on and like, you know, Priscilla saying, knows what it takes to, you know, whether it's bringing about a listing, whether it's working with a client, you know, mm -hmm. it's just... But you're going to spend the same amount of valuable time in conversation with somebody buying a hundred fifty thousand dollar trailer than somebody buying property for one point five million. Yeah, and that's and that, but that has to do with valuing people and right. relationships. Like you know, I, I will say one of the things that my 
I calling card or what, whatever you want to call it. You know, my one of the things that I love about this industry and kind of just what I do and who I am is I, you know, I care very deeply about my clients and their best interests and really like being there, you know, because I came from kind of that more financial planning mindset of I only want to make a great suggestion that's going to put you in a better position. And, you know, for me, I only think like that if I actually care. And it doesn't matter what the, you know, the dollar amount is at the end of the day, the money will follow. We'll, we, it'll all work out as long as that comes first. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Take care. I always have a like, little saying, it's like, take care of people that take care of you. So yeah. It's, yeah. So it's, no, it's exactly. I, I think, you know, a lot of people in our industry sometimes, you know, because especially when it's high activity, it's easy to go through things when it's slower activity, you know, they, they'll, you know, realize, oh, maybe I should have taken a little more, more time and, you know. There's there's ways to stay in front of people. There's ways to to build business the right way. So. Either either way, it's a small world in the real estate business and the mortgage business. So if yeah. if you build the reputation that you want or don't want, it's going to get around. Yeah. So I was just going to say, um, how much will prices keep going down? Because at the beginning you said like even before COVID, price, the prices were we're going up because oh, just Colorado is attractive to, to people. Yes. So like, will it still keep going down or is it at some point it's going to stop and then just... So right now on average, like I said, I go on to the MLS and I look all over the state. Um, and on average across the front range, any house that has been listed for over 60 to 80 days, I'm seeing a price drop of about 10000 to 20000 depending on the price. Lots of concession verbiage out there. Um, but yeah, people are starting to to be able to negotiate and get that, that house price dropped. Um, what we are hearing on the news, though, is for our state, rental prices are going up. So, you know, the first time home buyer, I mean, if, if you can afford it, just look for, I would say just look for a cheaper home. I mean, it's not, obviously not going to be your forever home when you're a first time home buyer, right? Yeah. It's really not. Mm-hmm. Get in there, find a, a place that you know fits your budget with the rates that they are now, because it. When you start to look at rentals, whether you're in Denver or in Fort Morgan, they are high mm-hmm. and they're going up. Yeah. And it's it's not going to stop. We're seeing home values come down, but we're seeing rent go up. Well, and again, do you think do you think after like say so much more people start buying homes than than the people that rent a place like an apartment, they're going to be like. Well, I don't have people to fill it up, so they start dropping the price too? Do you think that will go, or not really? I'm not sure, because if you look at how many people are moving into our state month to month, it's just people have to be put somewhere. And in 2019, they did a survey, and it said that the state of Colorado was way underbuilt. Like, we should have started building new subdivisions in, like, 2017, 2018, and we didn't. So they're trying to play catch-up. So landlords just don't have to drop the prices because you call places and there's no openings and they're like oh we'll put you on the list and you know maybe in 12 months we'll give you a call if if we have an apartment open up well and and one thing that i've seen also is that as renters you know our renter median age is getting older as well and as they're getting older and rents are going up you know they're starting to see like even if my payment for a mortgage is $500 $500 more a month, you know, obviously something substantial. They would still rather do that because A, it's going to actually build you equity over time so you can potentially move up into a nicer mm-hmm. place later on. Or again, refinance, get a lower interest rate and have that lower monthly payment. So one way or the other, they're seeing kind of the big picture and they're wanting to, you know, I think that was also a part of the COVID generation of really with jobs we can work from anywhere we want as long as as long as we have wi-fi you yeah. know they a mm-hmm. lot of people are working from home and you know so they can pick whatever location they want to be in and they can actually settle so i think all those factors combined we're starting to see renters really are wanting to buy a house even if it is a little bit more expensive I think really, you know, the biggest issue is that I, I think there would our demand would go even higher if we had a greater supply of, oh, yeah. of places. And, and one thing I didn't mention is we do have a high rate of uh, people that have lived in Colorado for 20, 25 years. They're moving out, too. You yeah. know, they, they are moving to cheaper states, Tennessee, Kentucky. Um, the two-bedroom I just sold a few blocks away, 
um, yeah, they moved to Tennessee and they're paying like half yeah. of the cost. And so, but there's still a higher percentage of people actually moving to our state. Yeah. Why are people moving so much? So if you look at our land taxes and even insurance, um, some property insurance taxes, they, we're still one of the cheapest states. Whereas if you look at Texas, their land tax is so much, it's almost three or four times more than what Colorado is. So say I'm looking at a $500,000 house here, that house, if we're comparing apples to apples, in Texas might be 300000 But when you look at the taxes that are spread out from, what, 12 months of payments, yeah. you're dividing $5,000 by 12 months, whereas here, for that same house, it's only 1200 for the year. Yeah. So 1200 divided by 12, way less than 5000 divided by 12. So your your payment is almost the same or even more in Texas. Yeah, the only big difference I think from like say like Texas, those those are places where they there's no income tax. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think that's kind of what. The but I mean, at the end of the day, the the payment's almost the same thing. Like you're saying, right. it's almost a, just because of the taxes. Yes. Well, and they don't we, pay taxes somewhere else, but they pay them. You know, they yeah. don't pay them on this, but they pay them on this. Right. So it's like it'll it'll okay. it'll work. Well, and we even just passed on this most recent election. We just passed the prop that lowered the state income tax <laughs> from what four point five five to four point four percent. So, we're we're generally you know as a state. Income tax wise is you know we're generally pretty low. Property tax wise, we are very low. Like my yes. my in laws from Minnesota were just visiting, and their property taxes are double ours. Um, mm -hmm. And they and they have state income tax as well. That's also not that high. So I mean, it just it very much depends on your state. But then even when it comes to um, demand, you know, it even changes even just within our own state, you know, Northern Colorado still has quite a bit of demand maybe, whereas Denver, not so much just because prices are so high, so much higher there yeah. than they are here. So it kind of just, you can really break it down to where people are individually um, and what area they are. The, I had a, I mean, I like numbers. I have a couple more numbers for you guys because I keep thinking it's like on the like stuff how how it goes because I I like to read the trends, see what's what's yeah. happening. Mm -hmm. So it's like in people they like to compare back to like oh what's it gonna happen like in oh eight will it you know will it yes or no. So it's like in oh seven like a median price home was like forty seven nine about mm -hmm. and the wages average is about fifty grand. Yeah. So like now in twenty twenty two home price is like five seventy seven and the wages wow. are seventy two. Yeah. So the home price more than doubled. More than doubled. And then the wages, we should the average price should be like, uh, income should be like Much 120 higher. then. And that's, you know, you to know. keep the trends. So right. and so yeah. the, like where I'm going with is like, it's gonna get to a point where people can't afford it because if you look at the payment, if someone's making six thousand, so that that's probably like what about six thousand, yeah about six thousand a month that they're making. Yeah. So they're, and right now about they're gonna spend. Their so everything yeah, that you just over half. said. <clears throat> is the reason that we're seeing families integrate with each other. Mm -hmm. We're hearing okay. a lot of, oh, my, you know, I'm moving in my granddaughter with her new husband or whatever. So families are coming together because they can't afford living okay. on their own and having one or just maybe two incomes, depending on where they are and what they do for a living. In 2019, there was a survey in Denver that if you didn't make at least $30 an hour, you could not survive in Denver. Now, that was in 2019. So right now, it's and, way more now, huh? Oh, yeah. And so um, we just took a class a few weeks ago, and it literally said, in, in this day and age, it doesn't matter where you live, if you don't have multiple sources of income, you are living paycheck to paycheck. I think everybody's living to pay. If you think about it, like statistically, I, I believe it's like almost 70% yeah. of, of Americans don't have $1,000 in savings. Yeah. Or they've tapped into their savings just to buy groceries nowadays, and they had to, never had to do that before. Yeah. Yeah. No, so and that's, well, and that's part of the whole, you know, inflation, uh, like grocery store, you know, inflation. It's funny. We talk about like nationwide, the most recent, you know, reading was 7.7%. But I mean, if eggs at one point were a dozen eggs were like you know one ninety nine and now they're three ninety nine that's way more than seven or eight percent so yeah, obviously it's double <laughs> it's and that's that's the thing is like it really just depends on you know that's how I really more for you inflation but the other thing that we're actually seeing now this is more of a nationwide thing uh, but for new construction multifamily. Uh, construction so for multi so basically multiple units under yeah, one roof yeah. 
those are the biggest uh, ticket item right now. So single family home, new construction. So a normal, you know, again, three, four bed home. Those aren't being constructed nearly as much as multifamily right now. And a lot of that is because, you know, they're trying to find places where people can yeah. contribute into the mortgage. And, you know, it could be just one person on it. But that's a good point yeah. you bring up. So Two Valley Builder, um, we're par they're partnered with Realty One and they offer a, um, a blueprint where you can actually have them construct a mother-in-law suite in the back that has yeah. its like own entry, its own kitchen and everything. That is an option. On a different yeah. property somewhere else. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> close, but not too close. But close wow. enough to Are take care of my kids. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, tell us more about that situation. I know. Uh, but yeah, I think that's the idea. Also, like with fam <clears throat> like especially with young families, you know, if there's young children, you have two working parents. If you have, you know, a mother, mother or father-in-law yeah. staying with you, um, you know, help cuts down on childcare costs. Right makes it easier to, for them to go out. Um, so again, there is definitely more, you kind of see those trends taking shape right now. Yeah, so I mean, do you guys have thoughts like just in general, like what will be going on maybe like, not just like in your guys' sector, but like in everything, like unemployment stuff? Cause there's some, got some more, got some more yeah, stats. Yeah, 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 more so, stats. So it's like Meta, you know, Meta Facebook, they, yeah, led, yeah. they laid off 11,000 workers. Twitter, 3,700. Mm -hmm. Uh, Robin her 30 30 percent of their people uh, Stripe 13 percent like all these big companies are laying off a lot of people so this is so do you think it'll trend to like because I mean we're rural out here but I, right. like in the urban do you think it'll start affecting it Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So you're hearing those huge layoffs, and, and they're going to happen more. Those are just very, very well-known companies. Yeah. But they're filling the squeeze like everyone else. So what it has them doing is it has their economists and their financial head people looking at the books, and they're saying, okay, where can we cut? Yeah. We're, we're spending so right. much money now, we can't afford that monthly output. What can we cut? And they're starting to cut the fat off the top yeah. is yeah. what's happening. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, those are the ones that have their financial people. So it's like there's small business owners that don't have financial people yep. that I think are going to get. Well, so if they don't modernize a little bit, it can get destroyed. See, well, but the, at the same time, you know, like like just even looking at the lending industry right now, like the more there's a lot of mortgage lenders that are going under right now. But if you look at the theme, a lot of those mortgage lenders were very big companies that had a lot of overhead. So if you ha if you're paying a okay. lot of executives a lot of area managers that's going to be a much larger expense whereas like the company i work for you know we're we're pretty small well smaller i mean we have 47 loan officers we have you know a team of four executives and a team of 11 processors but it's it's one of those where that is a relatively smaller company but our you know we, we don't have these corporate executives who are getting larger bonuses, have much larger right. salaries. So we're going to, we are in a much better position to thrive, even as a smaller company than somebody who is larger. And that's why, you know, all those companies you just said are obviously massive publicly They're traded companies. Ones, huh? They have a much larger overhead. Um, so if you're a, you know, an executive and you're looking at, well, do I take a lower paycheck or do I just cut 3,700 people? What's, like, what's generally going to say? Yeah, what? And we started to see that right before we left Wells Fargo. Yeah. You know, oh, we really? went from having, I think our state had 12 district managers or something like that, and mm -hmm. they literally eliminated that job. Yeah. So it's, it's a normal over time. Yeah. It's a corporate evolution. And then, you know, when things, when economically things start to rebound, you'll, you'll see some rebound come, with yeah. that, some come back. But yeah. But, but on a, like you're saying, a rule basis or under your own roof basis. You should be, even though, you know, it's not fun to do, but you should be looking at your expenses every month and literally eliminating the stuff that you really don't need. Like my son, I'm still on his account and <laughs> so I see stuff that comes out and I'm just like, wait, you have Hulu coming out and Netflix and, and the, the the kid's never home to yeah. watch, to, you know, he's, he's working and he's with friends and he's working on cars uh. and I'm like, how often do you use Netflix for fourteen ninety nine a month? Like you don't need it. Start cutting those things out. That's yeah. like twenty eight dollars, thirty dollars a month. It okay. That's half a tank of gas, maybe. You yeah. know. Well, and that's he's gonna fun. take. He's gonna take you off his account now. Oh yeah, like, I was gonna <laughs> say that's that's the lesson going, for this I'm his podcast. power of attorney. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> She'll get right back on. Um, oh, he I, doesn't care. I think the mortgage. You know, at least from like a mortgage standpoint. This is actually those kinds of conversations are something that I will have with clients 
We'll talk about the first how to home plan. Buyers. Yeah, and, and really, because even if they don't qualify for right now, or maybe they don't qualify for as much, you know, we have resources that we can put in front of them to help improve credit. We have, you know, we can go through and walk through budgets and things like this is how much we need to start saving a month. What can we cut? So, you know, it's one of those things where on an individual, I agree with Priscilla, on an individual basis, we can really help and model that that good behavior. But, you know, we'll, uh, we'll tell them not to pay attention to, you know, Meta's uh, CFO or something like that. I mean, that's that's the kind of stuff that, you know. It's big picture stuff, but it's still, you know, the idea is if you can get to a place where you have your budget under control, which I get it. It's not fun to look at. I mean, like, no, I don't think anybody is like, oh, I can't wait to get home tonight and like yeah. and dive into my spreadsheet. And if they're making a lot of money, I yeah, bet you yeah, it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, let me see how much. On about- payday. To yeah. you that, we're, we're targeting on payday. And the news was just talking this morning about, you know, Twitter was losing $4 million a month. Yeah. So, you know, Elon came in and I mean, the guy is obviously very business minded. It doesn't make any sense. Why would you want to look at that every month? Yeah. You know, but it does freak out everybody else in that business. Like, oh, oh I'm next. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. But I mean, it's you have to be smart with your money. You do. Mm-hmm. So, so like kind of going in terms of you guys, like, so what's something like, say, if someone says, I make 5000 a month. Like, what's something that's affordable for them? Because, you know, like if you rent a home, if you're going to rent an apartment, they'll be like, you need to make two times whatever the payment is so we know that you're going to be able Again, to Again, that's just one of the factors. Mm-hmm. How much credit card debt do you have revolving? Yeah, that's How true, many huh? vehicle payments do you have? Yeah. It, yeah, yeah that, that, that's where I was go- going with it because they'll be like, oh, I can afford I can afford this house. Like, yeah, on your wage, but then, like, but then you, you got you all this other stuff payment. and then you got kids and you got food and you start <laughs> yeah. adding it up. You're just like... Well, and, and just by, you know, by standard uh, lending guidelines today, I mean, we can, we're going to look at, you know, about 50% of what your gross income or basically everything you take in before taxes and whatever your, that is on a monthly basis. But then we do have to subtract, you know, auto, like auto loan payments, student loan payments, credit cards, any other personal child loans, support. any, 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 yeah, child support, anything that shows up on your credit report or is an obligation to you. Now, you know, like you were saying, like, obviously, there, then there's the other factors that we don't consider, like, you know, cost for kids, your utilities, things like that. We don't put that into your calculations every single time. So that's where also, so there's the logical piece, but then there's also the emotional piece of just because I can tell you, you know, hey, Monaco, you can afford this. You might in your, like, I could tell you we can legally do this. Everything's above legally. board. It's all good. Legally. You <laughs> might in your head be like, that. <laughs> I feel like I can't do that. And so and the, key, the key words are, I feel, you know, so I feel like I can't do that. So that's really. That's the, that's the sales hack. You buy, they buy on emotion. Go. There you go. Well, Most people buy on emotion. Costs yep. don't show up on your credit report. Correct. You know, so you have to, I mean, that's a living expense that you have to take into consideration. That yeah. a lot of people don't. That's yeah. why a lot of people, when the oil industry started, they have a twelve hundred dollar month truck payment because they're like, yep. ooh, F three fifty. Well, and they're making a lot of money. Well, like, they were. like you were saying. They well, in that were. one point, they were making <laughs> they were. a lot of money, they so were. it was easy to make that payment, and it was right. fun to to I mean, get the truck, and so yeah. <clears throat> so, so what's some of you guys like advice for for like a first time home buyer? Because I know we said, uh, you know, marry the house, date the rate. But then if you can't afford the house you want to marry, then it's kind of tough to do that. I would say as a first-time home buyer on the real estate side, when you start thinking that you're wanting to purchase a home, you need to be an educated consumer. And what I mean by that is literally look at your finances line by line, map out what you're spending so you know what you can afford. That way when you come to him, your numbers and his numbers are pretty close, right? Um, so you're not heartbroken when you go yeah, in. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then also have a, have a realistic timeline. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so not that, oh, we just started looking and we want to be in a house before Christmas. And you're like, uh, what? Yeah, you know. What next I mean. Christmas? Yeah. yeah, next Christmas, exactly. <laughs> um, and always, always ask a ton of questions. Yeah. And don't expect the professionals that you use to predict the future. That is not something that we're, that we should be doing, you know, 
I think that's the fastest way you can get sued. Yeah. Probably. Absolutely. And we've said some things on this podcast that are very questionable easily. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, no, I would say, yeah, just me, actually. Saying, uh, saying but you're no. doing things legal. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Um, I, you know, I would say the best advice is literally just get started. I mean, really, realistically, the whole idea of, you know, again, building wealth in real estate and, you know, that whole lifestyle all those people, whether you're talking people who own 100 houses or people who own two rentals, they started somewhere. They had to start somewhere. And again, don't get me wrong. There are environments that are better than others to start. But it, I just getting on the train in the first place is the best way to get started. And then, you know, to Priscilla's point, that's a lot of what I do with first time home buyers is just honestly, we're kind of building a plan is really what it is. Now, sometimes that plan can be like, yeah, you can buy you can buy this house by next Christmas. You can ho start hosting holiday parties with your friends and family in 30 days from now. Other times it's like, actually we got some things to work on. Here's here's our prescription. Yeah. Here's our plan. You need to pay off this credit card or Yeah. And then we're going to we're going to stay in touch. We're going to stay connected on that and, you know, whether so again, whether it's something where we're mortgage ready tomorrow or we can it's going to take six months to a year we're going to stick with you so yeah. i mean that's that's the idea i think is just just get started so for first time home buyers have professionals that are always teaching you not pushing you yeah but teaching you step yeah. by step they're staying in conversation with you all the time my my cousin just went through a really bad i don't know why she didn't reach out to me first but she uh <laughs> went to refinance her house like middle of summer and she sent all her information. This guy sent her an online app to do through his mortgage company. She put all of her information in there, car payments, all the stuff. And he literally just said, okay, this is what you qualify for, and sent it in an email. Never picked up the phone and called her. Never explained each number line by line. I mean, didn't even get to know her or anything. He literally just looked at an online application. And she's like, he sent it to me and was like, okay, yeah, just sign on the electronic box whenever I'll get started. And that is not the kind of experience you want. Yeah. No. No. I mean, I, I think that's that's really the biggest thing on us as lenders is to really take the time to actually explain, you know. Again, there's there's usually three or four main numbers that everybody's trying to figure out. But then, you know, some people want to know more about that. And that's really what we're here to do and, and just to truly, truly help. But, but que so one question back to you, Eric. I mean, what, what do you feel more like if you are a first time home buyer like what would what more do you think people would want to know like what's maybe something that from an outsider's perspective and i guess for both of you like what would you want to know more from us well one thing it would so. be um cuz there are like uh programs that can help yeah. first time home buyers like what, yeah. what are some of those that so you know it depending on kind of what your situation is we do have things like that can help you with, out with your down payment so like I just closed on on a client a um, couple weeks ago now, she brought a total of a thousand dollars to the entire transaction. Oh, so uh, again, so wow. it can have be as low as a thousand bucks that you're bringing to the transaction. She bought a you know three hundred seventy thousand dollar you know house in, in Loveland. So I mean, it can happen, um, but it's things like that where we can help out. Whether it's a down payment. Whether we're looking at you know credit issues, things like that, you know we have ways to to truly help. Uh, but then yeah, for first time home buyers, we also have you know specific things that will help reduce your pricing, <coughs> meaning uh, what your cost is for the interest rate, and then also you know keeping your monthly. Since a lot of those first time home buyers can't bring twenty percent down. We can give you programs that will reduce your what's called your mortgage insurance or your PMI payment that will lower your monthly payment overall. So, you know, it's things like that that yeah we have access to that we can help out with. Is that is there somewhere like that someone can go and like look up those those like programs that can help, or is it just like going in and like talking to? to you know, like you? some of it some of it's actually can be something like you know so for instance the big one in Colorado is is called Chaffa or C H F A. So they have a website that you can go in and they can kind of go over everything. Um, we also use another one called CHAC, which is the Colorado Housing Authority Corporation. They have they those are both you know state sponsored programs that will you know help first-time home buyers or even sometimes in some situations second-time home buyers that with down payment 
uh, assistance. Um, so again, those are things that are publicly available. But then sometimes there's also you know specific things within your county. You know, I've seen programs like specifically just for the city of Loveland or something like that. So it, it'll depend sometimes on very specific programs within your individual lender. But then there's also things across the state. Um, and yeah. So you, cool. you're, yeah. You, this is your home yeah. currently. Mm -hmm. How long have you been here? Um, put me on the spot. How long has it been? Two and a half years, I believe. So not yeah. super long. Yeah, not super long. Yeah. So in in your whole buying and real estate experience, what would you have changed? What do you wish, looking back now, you'd been like, oh, I wish they would have done that for me. Like my with the people that I worked with. Mm -hmm. I mean, the guy the guy I worked with, he's he's really good. I, I'm okay. still kind of even like a little in touch with him. So nice. so it's That's it's pretty good. Awesome. That's what they. And it's be. uh, I mean, I th I think it was great because I've gone through other. I've had other properties and houses before, okay. and uh, so I kind of know how it is. But I think probably this the last one I just had. I think he's probably that's one nice. of the yeah. Nice, good. Yeah, he's, good. he's pretty good. No, and that's so. and that's the idea is if you have a good relationship with that person, you trust that person. Like right. They're gonna help you. They're gonna educate you. They're gonna put you in. You know. And also, I mean, at the end of the day, we only want to do business with people that we feel good about doing business with. I mean, realistically. You know, uh, like I said, there's a lot of us, but, you know, again, being highly qualified is one thing, but then it's also, you want to feel good about who you're trusting this decision with. This is probably going to be the biggest purchase of your life. Right. So, you know, again. Well, and, and don't quote me on this, but I, I believe there's over 36,000 real estate agents in the state of Colorado, but they're not all active. And active really means uh, they're keeping their license every year and selling s at least seven or more homes in a year. So if you think about it, that's really not a large chunk of us that are really, really moving things along yeah. in the industry. And I, and I know I, I, this now, this is this is a statistic from 2020, so it's kind of old, but there was 21,000 licensed loan originators in the state of Colorado. So, you know, there's probably, truth be told, probably more now, but same thing it is what Priscilla's saying. Not all of them are, you know incredibly active so it just kind of depends on who you have but if you have a great relationship with somebody that's awesome I yeah mean, that's i had one last question for for both of you yeah. it's uh so i mean we know a lot of hispanic people a lot of people that don't have like legal papers and stuff to be able to purchase is there some sort of like assistance or ways that like if they have an i-10 number or stuff to to be able to purchase a house so we actually have I-10 loans. So there okay. are so, so specific loans that are just for folks who have I-10 numbers and they don't have socials. So yeah, well, there are you know specific types of loans that will that will work for that population. And just one of the main requirements for that is they have to have the permanent residency Correct. card. Correct. As long as yeah. they've got that. Okay. So, yeah. So and, and and well and even in some cases even not. So I mean it okay. just kind of depends on and again the the loan you know terms and everything change but yeah no they absolutely can okay. qualify uh it's not something that would stop them from qualifying yeah because that's a big thing like in the hispanic culture I mean, in reality once you look at the financials and stuff they make a lot of money but sometimes they don't have uh the credit the, the, yeah, the they credit don't have like or, the or they don't have like a residence or a social to buy one yeah. but in reality they have a lot more money than someone that does have one well, and, but and they, they can't and they're scared to like go and ask someone yeah they're they scared of, that's the fear like if yeah. people that they don't want to look dumb you know so they yeah so they don't well and, ask. and i've uh, i've also you know worked with families you know like where mm -hmm. like, particularly hispanic families who like are are already living together and they're just, you know, at this point now they're looking at, you know, buying a house together. So, again, we can do that, too. So it just depends on okay. whatever their the individual family situation is. And then, but, yeah, it, it is not something that would stop them from being able to buy a house. So, absolutely, definitely talk to, you know, again, not everybody has those types of loans. I would probably suggest working with a mortgage broker in particular. Um, you know, some banks may have them, some banks or credit unions may have them, but I almost guarantee you most brokers will have them. And I think it's important as we close, I know you said you were going to just ask one more question. No, but, that's fine. Go, keep going. Um, <laughs> it's just one that I had on top of my mind before yeah, I yeah. forgot it. Something yeah. I learned um, that I didn't know until Connor explained to me, but um, years ago, it's very beneficial to find somebody like Connor that can see what everything is offered, all the VA stuff or whatever. If if you, and I've, I've heard a lot of my clients say, oh, but 
I only use Fort Morgan State Bank and I love them. I'm going there for my home loan. It's like, that's great. That's wonderful. But that banker can only, only do yeah. what's under that roof. Yeah, they only got what's there. He can see everything yeah. nationwide, right? Yeah, because you're a bro- broker, right? I'm a broker. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it, it's not that we're trying to deteriorate that relationship and say, oh, don't use them. It's just n- understand what's only going to be offered to you. Yeah. And, and I think that's the difference between, like, say, you know, banks, credit unions, or, you know, there are other larger lenders that are, uh, we call them correspondent lenders, so they're... They're not a bank. They're not a credit union. They're just doing mortgage, but they only have their own uh, products and services. So, you know, as a broker, we are shopping the market. We're looking around. We're seeing, you know, and generally are, you know, and then every broker is also different, too. They may have specific things they're trying to target or maybe specific programs they're, they're working with. So, you know, again, it never hurts to, to look around, make sure that you, you know, have uh, but a good opinion on everything. But, I, you know, again, I think it comes down to, a, you know, that relationship. If you, you know, like you were talking about with your mortgage broker, if you have somebody who you really trust who, you know, again, until that changes, my guess is you're probably not going to want to look around until, you know, something upsets that relationship. But never, never hurts in the meantime. So, so where could people find you? So I, so my, on social, you know, you can find me on uh, Instagram at Connor, the mortgage guy. And that's C O N O R. That's uh, just one N. I know I'm a beautiful, unique snowflake. (laughs) Um, So yeah, C O N O R, the mortgage guy. Um, And then on Facebook as well, you can just search uh, Connor Bodock and Aslan home lending. And then of course uh, you've got, you can call or text anytime. I mean, I, I love it when people shoot me a DM, but if you prefer to call or text, uh, my cell is 415-250-8753. What about you, Priscilla? Well, yeah. I work for um, Realty One Group. Uh, we had a brand new office just open up in the Loveland location, which is nice. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a main Greeley office. Um, but being a, a real estate agent in the state of Colorado means we can sell anywhere. So it just because we have an office in Greeley or Loveland does not mean that's where we're restricted to. It's anywhere in the state of Colorado. Um, so I have helped all up and down the front range, all the way out east. And I do a lot of driving when I'm very <laughs> active. Um, and so um, Chris, my husband, has been a really, really good way to get my name out there for sure. <laughs> um, but I have a Facebook page, Lighthouse Homes, um, is my personal real estate company um, through Facebook. And then, um, yeah, my phone number is, is on the website as well, 970-515-2556. Yeah, we'll put all the we'll put all those links down below. But for sure, check out Chris's. He, he's 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 been a guest here before, so check his out <laughs> nice. too. Nice. We'll, we'll yes, also link that one. Uh, yeah, down, yeah, yeah, down below yeah. Like, yeah. Plug it. There he had go. the cool headphones that like look legit. Yeah. Like, dang. yeah. That's that's yeah. the only. We don't thing we don't want to mess up Connor's hair, so yeah, that's why we, gonna say, we we took him out today. When you when you actually see this video later, you'll get the joke. That's uh, it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, thank you guys so much for for coming out and taking time out of your guys' busy schedules. To, to yeah. just come and chat with us. No, we really awesome. Hopefully, it. we can do a recap maybe, you know, spring, April 1st, and just look back to now, November, and oh, see what's yeah. changed. I think yeah. there's going to be some big changes. See all those predictions that we made today, see if they actually <laughs> what, came true. See what happened? I yeah, didn't yeah, there you anything. go. Yeah, I was going to say it was all me. But no, thank you all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you both so much for yes. having us. And hopefully this really helped. You know, that's that's my biggest thing. And I know Priscilla feels the same way. Like if we gave, you know, one one or two good nuggets yeah. for people yeah. to, to think about, you know, job's done. So appreciate yeah. it. So thank you again for making that happen and allowing that to happen. Yeah, for sure. So, guys, if you guys liked the, what you heard, the conversation, if, or if you didn't like it, still give it a thumbs up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and just make sure to hit that subscribe button, guys. Thank you so much for, for tuning in. I'll just leave you guys with our, our motto here on the podcast, that an act of rebellion is to question. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks, guys. See you Thank later. You. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, underrated, underrated. We the underdogs, underestimated. Yeah. Underrated.